In the Russian Far East lies the country's largest region, Yakutia, also known as the Republic of Saha. In 1977, a mysterious incident happened on its territory when members of two simple farmer families who had left for summer work started dying one after another. Within only a month, 12 people died. But it's not just the number of victims that's scary, it's that we know virtually nothing about the actual causes of the incident, and each version of events is more absurd than the other. Let's dive into this eerie case together. I've already made two videos about incidents that happened in Yakutia, the disappearance case of two girls from Sinsk, and the story of Karina Chikitova's miraculous rescue. If you haven't seen them yet, I suggest you watch these videos. In them, I talk more about what Yakutia is like. In short, it is a unique region, the nature is breathtaking, the climate is severe, and the culture is incredibly diverse. Many small villages are scattered across Yakutia. One of them is Arilah of the Churapchinsky district. Here, the winters are freezing, with temperatures dropping down to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and the summer months are hot. Arilah has only three proper streets, Komsomolska, Sreitelna, and Charanska. It has a school, a kindergarten, a small cultural center, and a post office as well as a church that stands over the lake that gives the village its name. Official figures from January 1, 2021 put the population of the village at 297 people. Both the Russian and the Yakut languages are spoken in the settlement. There are no stores or food delivery, so the villagers survive on what they can grow themselves. They breed horses and cows, sell milk, grow vegetables, and pick berries in the forest. Now that we've got an idea of the setting in which this mysterious incident took place, let's go back 44 years, to May 31st, 1977. The small village in the Taiga forest is waking up. People are getting ready for work. Summer is coming up. The time to sow the future harvest, pick the first berries, and go fishing. The latter two pastimes are probably just about the only things the local children can do for fun. On that day, two families, the Ayanitovs and the Siftsevs, together with Tatiana Vinakurova, the elder sister of the head of the Ayanitov family, went to a farm known in Yakut as Sailik, located in a remote area called Komnuo. Usually, the Ayanitovs would go to another place known as Similach, because it was their ancestral village. But that summer, the brigadier of the collective farm that the family belonged to made them go to Komnyo, practically by force, as some sources say. Brigadiers of Soviet collective farms, or kolkhoz, had the power to make such decisions. The collectivization process that led to the creation of such farms was completed in Yakutia by 1940, and in spite of some violent excesses, played an important role in the agriculture of the faraway Northern Republic, giving previously impoverished peasants a chance to feed their families. Even in the 1970s, a kolkhoz brigadier was a significant figure in the lives of the farmers. He accepted their work, recorded the volume of crops harvested, and labor days worked. He distributed tasks among brigade members, tracked plan fulfillment, accounted for the brigade's equipment and work done by its members. As a supervisory authority, he also monitored discipline on the farm. Esayalik, which was where the Ayanitov and Siftev families went, is a type of Yakut summer house which basically functions as a summer farm. Unlike Urasas or Yurts, which are simply types of housing, a Sayalik is considered to be a separate village settlement that doesn't have a store. A family could spend the whole summer in a Sayalik because agricultural work was not just the bread of the local population, 
but pretty much the only pastime available. A total of 16 people went to the Sayalik. Five of them were grown-ups, the rest were children and teenagers. The eldest one, Marfa Siftova, was 18. She was a student at a teacher training college and came to visit her relatives during her vacation, though she hadn't initially planned to do so. The youngest child, Vanya Ayanitev, was six years old. Today, only one participant of those events is still alive, Semyon Ayanitev, who was 11 at the time of the incident. He recalls that during that ill-fated summer, things on the farm went as usual. The grown-ups worked hard from dawn to dusk, while the children helped them out, feeding the calves, bringing water and firewood, or looking after the house when the adults went away to work in the hayfields. Occasionally, they would take the older boys with them to help cut, dry, and rake the grass that was to become the winter's hay supply. For almost a month and a half, the Ayanitovs and Siftovs lived as one family, sleeping under the same roof and eating the same food which the mothers cooked together. Kolhos farmers had the right to own a small number of animals, and meat was the most important part of the family's diet. They ate beef, duck, fowl, and horse meat. In the forest, they went hunting, fishing, and berry gathering. On the farm, they grew potatoes and baked bread. Simeon does not recall what his family ate in the days before the tragedy. He spent that time with his father and brothers in the hayfield. The men only returned to the Sayalik to replenish food supplies, which wasn't every day. According to Simeon, everything was as usual. They didn't eat any new food, let alone any exotic delicacies and no one noticed any suspicious smells or tastes. This was why everybody became really scared when, on July 23rd, Simeon's 12-year-old brother, Alosha, fell ill. The boy was constantly feeling thirsty and nauseated, complaining of a burning sensation in his throat and dryness in his mouth. He was so feeble and pale that it seemed all the life force was leaving him. His head ached terribly, he became short of breath, and constantly wanted to sleep. But he couldn't sleep, falling into a delirium instead. Soon, he stopped eating. His symptoms looked like a mixture of myocarditis, hypotosis, toxic nephritis, and toxic encephalomyelitis. We don't know if his relatives tried to treat Lush's conditions at home and if they did, then how? But on the same day, he was taken by motorcycle to the village hospital in Kitanach, where the doctor decided the child had appendicitis. He was transferred to the Churupchinsky district hospital and taken into the OR, where the surgeons realized that there was no appendicitis. The doctor stopped the operation and continued monitoring the boy, not knowing what to do next. They never did find out what was wrong with him. Lush's conditions only became worse. And on the 26th of July, three days after the onset of the mysterious disease, he died of heart failure. His body was brought back to the village and buried. But that was just the beginning. Between July 30th and August 6th, all members of the Ayanitev and Siftev families ended up in the hospital. Simeon's father and his older brother became sick a bit later once they returned from the hayfields. The efforts of the doctors did nothing to alleviate the patient's suffering. On August 6th, the 11-year-old Vasya and the 9-year-old Dunya of the Siftsev family passed away. The rest were transferred by plane to the Republican Hospital in Yakutsk. In the following two weeks, nine more people died in its ICU. On August 7th, the 18-year-old Marfa Ayanitova passed away. On August 8th, the 14-year-old Praskovia Siftseva died. The mothers of families, the 46-year-old Marfa Siftseva and 45-year-old Daria Ayanitova, died on the 9th of August. On August 12th, 
the Ionita brothers, the six-year-old Vanya and 13-year-old Igor passed away. Their aunt, the 58-year-old Tatiana Vinokurova, succumbed to the disease on the 15th of August. The 48-year-old Vasily Sivtsev died on the 18th of August. August 23rd became the last day for the 15-year-old Irina Sivtseva. We don't know if she was aware that she had survived for longer than all her relatives. Semyon Ayanitov was also brought to the Republican Hospital in Yakutsk. He was nauseated and started vomiting, soon falling into a coma. Seeing that he was losing consciousness, the doctors were ready to give up on him and sent him to the morgue, Simeon recalls. I remember the cold and a voice saying, oh, this child is alive, and being taken on a gurney somewhere, I couldn't understand anything, everything seemed foggy. Later on, my dad, my older brothers Roma and Kolya and I were sent to Moscow. No one told us who was dead, who was alive, how our relatives were doing. We recovered there and came back in September by helicopter. Sometime before the flight home, my father told us that there was no one left but us. It was most likely the emergency hospitalization at the Moscow Sklifosovsky Institute that saved the lives of the 11-year-old Simeon, 16-year-old Roman, 17-year-old Nikolai, and their father, Simeon Igorovich. Everyone who succumbed to the mysterious illness had the same symptoms. Dry mouth, fatigue, drowsiness, headache, burning sensation in the throat, nausea. The autopsy results were shocking. The unknown disease impacted the internal organs, covering them with ulcers and in some cases, even turning them into mush. The substance that poisoned the Ionitavs and Siftavs was clearly very strong. However, the conclusion of the expert commission, which was made up of forensics experts, toxicologists, and chemists from Yakutsk and Moscow, were surprisingly laconic. The etiological factor of the disease could not be established. Only a few toxicologists and one infectious disease specialist suggested that the disease was caused by a neurotoxic poison. A criminal investigation into the deaths of 12 people was launched first by the prosecutor of the Churubchinsky district, then of the Yakut Republic, and later the prosecutor general's office in Moscow took up the case. A large investigation team arrived in Kamnuol. The Saya League was closed off. Everything was tested. The water, the soil, the air, even the laundry detergent. Samples were taken not only from the food that the families had eaten, but also from the compound feed for the livestock, though none of the animals had gotten the mysterious disease. Not only did the team test everything, they also interrogated everybody, neighbors, relatives, acquaintances, and even the survivors themselves. The case file became thicker, questions became more numerous, but there were no answers inside. The food the families ate was ordinary. Each day on the sale leak went exactly like the previous one. The only oddity was the people who survived were those who had gone to the hayfields and were later transferred to Moscow. Maybe they came into contact with the pathogen only very briefly, and that saved their lives. One of the people who investigated the Orelach incident was Leonid Diodorov from the Churubchinsky District Prosecutor's Office. Besides trying to shed light on this mysterious poisoning, he also worked as a private detective and a lawyer. He believed that the most important thing to do in the case was to exhume the bodies. Diodorov started working on the case in 1977 when he interrogated an inhabitant of the Tatinsky district who was passing by the Sayalik of the two families and had asked them for some water before going about his business. He had presumably spent a short while at the farm, but didn't eat or touch anything. He was found unharmed, meaning the water wasn't poisoned. 
the neighbors of the Ayanitavs and Sefsevs, who lived only a few hundred feet from the ill-fated house, also did not experience any adverse effects. Speaking of food poisoning, according to one of the versions, the families could have been poisoned by a watermelon brought from Tashkent by a student and later on brought by Semyon Ayanitov. The fruit may have contained nitrates, and the symptoms of nitrate poisoning are indeed worse than those of ordinary food poisoning. It can cause heart issues, such as a fall in blood pressure, tachycardia, convulsions, and shortness of breath. A high nitrate concentration can seriously damage the mucous membranes in the stomach and intestine. However, that doesn't explain the ulcers and the mush of organs that were found during the autopsy. Watermelon poisoning simply couldn't do that kind of damage. The possibility that the KGB or other secret services were involved was also discussed. Some suggested that the Yakuts were poisoned by radioactive debris, the rocket fuel component heptal or a gas of uncertain origin. Heptal poisoning looks similar to the poisoning in our case, causing severe damage to all internal organs, especially the esophagus and kidneys. However, if the water or soil in Komnuo had been contaminated by heptal, the number of victims would have been much higher. Nonetheless, the thought that some rocket or probe crashed down from orbit during military tests and the authorities covered it up seems to be hinted at even in the words of investigator Diodorov himself. In an interview with the Yakut newspaper, he spoke about the alleged confidentiality of the criminal case and the involvement of KGB officers in it. If something is confidential, the Soviet government is involved. For Soviet citizens, this was axiomatic. Other theories suggested an ancestral curse or intentional poisoning. Even Semyon Ayanitov, however, doesn't take the latter theory seriously. According to him, his parents had no enemies, no conflicts, and had always lived an honest life. Whereas the fact that even the survivors didn't get to live a long and happy life seems to lend credibility to the idea of ill fate. Semyon's father died in 1993 from obstruction of the stomach, possibly as a result of the poisoning. The older brother, Nikolai, died of a heart attack, and Roman died in a motorcycle crash. Going back to the idea that the families fell victim to poison or some chemical weapon from a secret lab, it seems the most plausible compared to the other versions. They probably ingested the poison with food because their first symptoms had to do with the stomach and intestine, and it was these organs that were found deformed during the post-mortem. Forensics experts and toxicologists were dumbfounded. Where could the families have come into contact with such a powerful poison? Where could it have been synthesized? One theory suggested that the poison was contained in an ampule sewn into the leg of a duck, which was then caught and eaten by the families who didn't notice the danger. There is indirect evidence for this. The only family members that survived were the ones brought into the Moscow Sklifosovsky Institute. Perhaps the doctors there knew what sort of poisoning it was and could therefore successfully stabilize and treat the patients. Anatoly Chomchoyev, who in 1985 became head of the Civil Defense and Emergency Response Commission, came to the conclusion that the reason for the deaths of the Yakut farmers was simply medical negligence. Anatoly and his team worked on the case for eight years. Their conclusions created a new version. The families died of botulism. Chomchoyev's team decided that the doctors in Yakutia made a mistake and couldn't identify the disease in time, which led to fatalities. Botulism is an infectious disease caused by the bacterium called Clostridium botulinum, known for its use in the cosmetics industry under the brand name Bodox. In a low oxygen environment, this bacterium produces the botulinum toxin 
possibly the most dangerous toxic substance known to a man. It enters the human body through the ingestion of improperly prepared food in which the bacterium or its spores can thrive and produce the toxin. Foodborne botulism is common among adults, but it can also develop in a contaminated wound or by being inhaled. In infants, it is usually caused by an infection in the gut. The clinical pattern of the disease is blurred. The patient presents with a gastrointestinal disorders such as diarrhea and vomiting, as well as neurological issues, muscle weakness, speech impairment, swallowing problems, and paralysis. This is accompanied by a dry mouth, difficulty breathing, and decreased blood pressure. Unfortunately, symptoms of botulism are often mistaken for those of a stroke, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or myasthenia gravis. If untreated, botulism is fatal in around 10% of cases. Once the disease has been diagnosed, the patient must be injected with an antitoxin as soon as possible. In more severe cases, supportive care is also necessary, including mechanical ventilation. Perhaps Chemchoyev insisted on the botulism version because he, being a military man, knew well of how the army used botulinum toxin against enemies when a cheap and efficient poison was needed. Anatoly believed that the families got poisoning from the fowl meat they ate that day. Botulism develops at temperatures around 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was hot that day, almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Ayanitov bought the meat in the village of Churupcha, brought it back to the farm on the horseback, and put it in a zinc pot in the cellar. If we presume that conditions in the cellar are close to a vacuum, similar to those during canning, then it is possible that the spores in the meat could have started producing botulinum toxin. Besides, it's not recommended to use zincware for canning or storing marinated raw meat. However, other families that had brought the same foal meat did not get poisoning. Could the meat really have gone bad in such a short time without the Ionitovs and Siftsevs noticing the fact? Another version is how much poison will one need to poison 12 people. Here's what Leonid Diodorov said about it. For some poisonous substances, 3 grams is enough to kill an enormous number of people. Basically, I think that in the absence of the truth, any hypothesis will sound plausible. Even haptal poisoning. Back in the day, in the town of Pokrovsk, there was an animal farm, Holbus. There, about 3,000 animals died at one point, all at the same time. The cause of death remained unknown. Forensics showed elevated levels of fluorine and barium in the animals' blood and assumed they died from wolvesbane poisoning, but nobody ever knew that for sure. Not everybody believes the official version that the families died from botulism. Chief epidemiologist Svetlana Gostorzevich, who led the case before Chemchoyev, refused to believe that botulinum toxin was the cause of the family's death. Chemchoya thinks that she simply doesn't want to acknowledge mistakes made by her and her colleagues from the hospital in Yakutsk. Simeon Ayanita disagrees with Svetlana as well, though he himself also had doubts when reading the autopsy documents that botulism could affect the internal organs so severely. I also heard that helicopters had been spraying insecticides over the croplands, but we didn't have any croplands at the time. There were many theories going around, and I don't know which is true. There is another issue that complicates things. Semyon Ayanitov refuses to consent to a second autopsy of his relatives. When my father and brothers were still alive, this was a taboo topic at home. I wasn't told anything. I am against exhumation. I believe one shouldn't disturb the dead. For centuries, the Saha people saw it as an evil deed. I've heard there's some new technology out there now, but I don't know. The Supreme Court of the Saha Republic often hears faith-based cases of appeal against decisions of lower courts to carry out exhumations. 
the Yakuts believe that an exhumation disturbs the peace of the deceased, and even simply visiting the burial spot is considered a sin. This has to do with the Yakuts' funeral cult and their attitude towards death. Sometimes, the relatives of the deceased would rather the victim's killer go free than their loved one's grave be disturbed. Lenny Diodorov and Semyon Ayanitev were inclined to believe the poisoning theory. Some of the documents related to the case might still be confidential, but we know that the government is aware of which poison killed those 12 people. For now, however, the case remains unsolved, and it's unclear if that will ever change. The case is now shelved due to the lack of an investigator who would be ready to take it up. Nonetheless, there is still hope that the family's relatives will at some point find out the truth. What could it have been? Which theory do you prefer? Write your ideas in the comments, subscribe, and come back next week for a new video.